Our next presenter is Nick Gritcham, who was the head of social prescribing at NHS England and is currently on a secondment for the health inequalities and improvement team to accelerate personalised care and social prescribing. Nick, over to you. Thanks, Huma, and just fantastic presentation from Dan to kick us off and really get us thinking about how we can work together locally in order to really use personalised care <clears throat> to address local health inequalities. So, um, Jenny, if I could have the next slide and I'm just going to sort of kick us off and give an overview. So I just thought I'd start with just reminding us all what we mean by personalised care and all of the different components of it. So when we're talking about personalised care, we are talking about these three things, these six things that come together to really help people have more choice and control over the way their health and care is delivered. So we're looking particularly at enabling choice, we're looking at shared decision making, we're looking at health coaching, we're looking at social prescribing, we're looking at personalised care and support planning, and we're looking at personal budgets and integrated budgets. So that we know that the long-term plan committed to rolling out so, uh, personalised care so that it's business as usual by 23-24. It's a universal offer, so available for everyone. Um, and we've already achieved the, um, the 2.5 million people accessing personalised care that we were due to achieve by 23-24. And so in the recent Secretary of State uh, speech on, on care, he mentioned a number of P's and one of which was personalisation, personalised care, which he reinforced his commitment to and increased the number of people to benefit from this by 23, 24 to 4 million. So these four, these three roles, social prescribing, care coordinator and health and wellbeing coach all have a key role to play in helping to deliver many of these things and also support people's access to other things like shared decision making, like choice um, and like personal health budgets. And so at the heart of personalised care is what matters to me. And so if we really try to understand for individuals and for communities what really matters to them, then personalised care can really be a fantastic way of helping to uh, remove some of the barriers that are in the way of people accessing uh, accessing good health and care. It can help improve people's experience of health and care and it can in turn improve their outcomes. And so there are many ways that these can do this. They take a very holistic approach. So they're looking at the social determinants of health, the wider issues affecting people's health and well-being, um, really taking that more personal approach. But they're also looking at how can we empower people to have more uh, confidence and knowledge um, to be able to take more control over not just their health and care and managing their condition, but also areas of their life like their housing and um, relationships and all sorts of things that can get in the way of people having good health and well-being. So absolutely can help address health inequalities. Um, but if we and if we go to the next slide, Jenny, please. We've got these three roles that can really tangibly can can provide additional capacity for primary care to be able to uh, work with people and local communities to address health inequalities. So you've got your care coordinator that can really be used to help identify particular populations and work closely to um, help people develop personalised care and support plans and to really be able to take that more proactive outreach approach. You've got your health and well-being coach who can really help people to think through how to manage their health and well-being and also develop peer support groups. So actually working with local community leaders to develop peer support groups that really help people to um, take that, that sort of um, community agency that, that Dan was talking about, uh, where communities are leading and helping to improve pe people's health and well-being locally. And then you've got your social prescribing link worker. And for many people that are experiencing health inequalities, that's often as a result of years of exclusion or discrimination. And their trust in public services can really have diminished 
um, and people don't necessarily come forward and access those public services and that includes primary care and your social prescribing link worker is a fantastic bridge between community groups um, and between really understanding what's available in the local community and co-creating support offers with them of uh, that will help them to address social determinants of health but also use things in the community that will um that they want to use to improve their health and well-being such as the arts such as sports such as nature so a much more holistic approach to health and care so if we can have the next slide please and i've just got an example here of um uh, uh, from bristol where the social prescribing link workers engaged and employed to work specifically with south asian community in a very ethnically diverse inner city area and how that proactive outreach of working with a community has really helped to understand what people's issues are and enable them to access welfare and advisory services which they didn't do um, originally um, but it's been through having that dedicated time from the link worker to work with the community to remove some of the barriers and build up the trust within that community and support the development of VCSE and also uh, community groups. So if we can have the next slide please. So how do we do this? So personalised care should and can address health inequalities but I guess my big message to you is that it does that if we work through proactive outreach and take a targeted approach. So we know that for many people um, who are most at risk of health inequalities, whether it's to do with deprivation or from different ethnic communities or from inclusion groups such as people with learning disabilities um, or mental health needs or gypsy travellers or people who are homeless, they don't, not, they don't always access primary care. And so it's absolutely important that we reach out and we work with communities to understand the need. Um, we know that also when we think about social prescribing, whilst as Dan mentioned, the infrastructure for primary care might not be so great, that's also true for the voluntary sector. So what we know across the country is areas of greatest deprivation are often those with the least um, developed voluntary sector infrastructure to connect people to activities in the community to support them and the wider social fabric. So it's really, really important that when we're thinking about personalised care, we actually use um, lots of information to be able to identify how to target our offer effectively so that it really does reach people who are most in need of personalised care. And Dan talked about the inverse care law. It shouldn't be the case that just because the most activated people are likely to act, come to their GP and therefore access social prescribing. We really want social prescribing, health coaching, care coordinators to be targeted at the communities and the people that need them the most in terms of health inequalities and um, and population health. So what we are really would advise people to do is to use the population health data. So the data is really, really important. We've got lots of primary care practices that can show how they're actually using that data. To use health inequalities data, so such as the health inequalities dashboard, but also to use the soft intelligence. So soft intelligence from your link workers and from your non-clinical staff who are working with the community. Um, but also from voluntary sector and from community leaders themselves, whether it's faith leaders or um, people from particular communities such as gypsy traveller communities that can really advise on what's the need locally and how do we best develop um, those out proactive outreach resources. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. So population health management, obviously key. Next slide, please, Jenny. Um, and, and it is very important when we talk about population health management that the data is important and we've got to get a lot better at data, but it's not enough in itself. And that's why we actually really need to be looking at who's missing from the data, um, exploring the data with people who have lived experience and really um, beginning to develop that soft intelligence. And, and I'm always asking, how do you, how, the link workers will often know what some of the groups are that are missing in their community and whether their uh, community activities are inclusive to all people who are at risk of health inequalities and are you actually capturing that and using that to inform commissioning. So if we can go to the next slide. So what we'd really be encouraging is 
using these approaches to do proactive case finding, really developing the proactive outreach and targeting particular communities and people that are most at risk of not benefiting from this and needing social prescribing, health coaching, care coordination and personalised care generally. Um, really working with people in their communities to co-produce that offer and collecting data to evidence what the impact has been. Um, and so we are really, so if we can have the next slide please Jenny. Thanks. And we'll go to the next one. I've embedded a video in here. I really encourage you to um, watch it afterwards. We'll send the link if it's if it's not working in the PowerPoint. But it's a really, really good example of a population health management approach to personalised care and to the three roles in particular. So if I can have the next slide, please, Jenny. Thank you. So new for 22-23. So we have a new personalised care spec for um, primary care. And in that is um, a requirement to develop more proactive outreach and targeted approaches to social prescribing. And we've designed it in a way that it speaks very well to the tackling neighbourhood inequality service so that it can really be used together to, to support your work. Um, so we're really encouraging the health inequalities leads, the personalised care roles, public health directors, local authorities, commissioners, voluntary sector leads and local community leaders to come together to understand what the need is. Then to develop the workforce. So who do you need in relation to that? Are your three roles trained to be culturally competent? We have a new um, module that we've just done on this. Um, are they recruited from communities most at risk of health inequalities? Are you really looking at how you can improve employment opportunities in your local area? Um, do they have the right clinical supervision? And um, are you specialising? I know in London you've um, been specialising with some children, young people's link workers, which is fantastic, given the work that um, Dan's just talking about with children, and young people and how we actually um, support people to find the things that they enjoy and get to the barrier, the, the things that are really causing um, the, the factors around obesity and helping people to have much better life chances um, as, as a result of that. Um, so really looking at the workforce, looking at what's available in terms of community activities and how you can come together to plan for those and fund those types of activities. And then really having the conversations at place about the, the, the fabric, the infrastructure of where people live, whether they have access to green spaces, what's the travel infrastructure like or for active travel and all of those sorts of things. So social prescribing and personalised care gives you a great opportunity to take a much more strategic approach to addressing health inequalities in local areas. So I'm going to whiz through the next slides, Jenny, just to let people know what's here. So um, one of the ways we encourage people to do this is the is the NHS approach to addressing health inequalities, core 20 plus five. So really looking at the 20 percent of the population, most deprived areas, the plus groups, so people in inclusion groups or other areas where they are likely to experience inequality. And then there are five key clinical areas which you can see. So that's one way that primary care networks could use the social prescribing link workers and the other roles to focus their support along with local priorities. And next slide, Jenny. Thank you. So here on the slide, I've got some support for the link workers. If you're thinking about recruiting them and supporting them, please look here. Um, next slide, Jenny, I've done the same for health and wellbeing coaches. And then if we go to the next slide, I've put the link for the Population Health Management Academy, some really fantastic information there. And finally, um, the address of where to go to for health inequalities dashboard called 20 plus five and more work around health inequality, tackling health inequalities in health and care. Thank you. And I'm gonna hand back to you, Hemo. Thank you so much, Nick, that was so, informative and, and really clearly demonstrating the link between personalised care and population health and what they can do to target health inequalities and in particular um, you know the, the importance of proactive outreach and targeting uh, and the and how vital link workers are in providing some of that soft intelligence on those underserved communities who don't access healthcare and really building those trusting relationships so thank you for that we do have a couple of questions um, 
So one really quick one is you gave some figures about the I think it was two million people receiving personalised care. And could you point to the source of, of this statistic? Um, and are people spread evenly across the country? Oh, very good point. Very good point. So, so the long term plan had an ambition of 2.5 million people experiencing personalised care. It's made up of a number of different things. So it's made up of a number of personalised care and support plans, number of social prescribing referrals um, and number of personal health budgets. So they've each got their own data sources. But one of the things that we are um, doing at Personalised Care is starting to look at the take up of those activities across different population groups. I mean, if I think, Hema, just about some of the social prescribing data, when I looked at it last year, um, the take up of social prescribing link worker roles was quite similar across areas of deprivation and across areas where there was less deprivation. And I think you have to ask the question, is, is that right? You know, are there reasons for that? It might be because that area has a lot of other things going on that can actually support people. But I think we really have got to start to look, particularly for those roles, about who we're recruiting, how we're supporting people and, um, and, and building those teams of personalised care roles within a multidisciplinary team, within a wider system connecting into um, whether it's coming out of a, of a hospital when you've had a, a ex experienced men poor men men mental health or things like that. Thank you. Um, and another question just linked to, to your last point is how can we ensure that the time of social prescribing link workers is spent supporting the those who are most in need? Yes, very good question. So I think this is where the service spec really gives that direction that we really want primary care to be thinking about this now, to be really looking at that population health management data, to be looking at the health inequalities data, to be listen, to, work, to be working with those system partners. So the health inequality lead in a primary care network really needs to be working with those three non-canonical roles, particularly the link worker, to see how they can do that proactive outreach and start working with local communities who are um, most at risk of health inequalities and co-designing those offers with them. So I think that's, um, that's, that's what we would really be encouraging people to do. And I think Dan's absolutely right. Start listening to people about where that means link workers would be and um, what sort of places they'd be spending their time in. We, we know that link workers have quite high caseloads at the moment, and we would really encourage primary care to make sure they're making full use of the R's funding to recruit enough of them to build teams so that link workers do have that 40% of their time to spend with the community as originally intended. Thank you. And just one last question around community organisations, particular funding community organisations. So will there be money for participatory funding coming down to PCNs or should we be able to find this in existing budgets? Mm. I, I think funding for community for social prescribing activities is very interesting because actually it's not just health that should be funding those activities. You know, the responsibility for many of those different support areas, whether it's housing, whether it's access to the arts or whether it's access to green spaces or whatever, comes down from a number of different government departments. And I think integrated care systems give us the opportunity to bring people together, to think creatively about how do we build and develop the workforce across for community connecting, for social prescribing? How do we build and develop those community activities and where are the gaps? So we should be using that population health management data, health inequalities data and our soft intelligence to really look hard at those activities that are available. So I know in green social prescribing sites, um, the DEFRA led project, um, you know, they, they've been actually looking at how can they make micro grants available. And sometimes that funding comes from lots of different sources, but it's how do they have a joint strategy to try and bring it together and align it. And in other places, and I know in London, they've also looked for how they might set that up such as a shared um, investment fund so that it can also attract charitable funding and um, even corporate social responsibility. So I think we've got to think really creatively. We've got to look at sustainable offer and think about how we develop the partnerships to make that happen. Thank you so much.